Just no. Please stop. Make it end. I would love for him to just be scorched by a dragon so that he's no longer in the narrative. He clearly is not gonna murder you. Chill out. None of us are shocked that he didn't end up murdering you and that he in fact is into you. But then, you know, in retrospect, as I think about it, it was the bare minimum. Didn't it even hit the bare minimum. I'm sorry, was I supposed to not pick up on that? Was it supposed to be a secret? That just, I'm sorry, that's not okay. I'm not okay with that. I wish I could wipe it from my brain. The inches between us feel like kindling, ready to burn at the first suggestion of heat, and I'm a living, breathing flame. This is everything I should run from, and yet denying the primal attraction I feel is completely, utterly impossible. Fourth Wing, basically the only book anyone has been talking about on the internet for the last couple months, and I haven't read it. I keep getting comments where y'all are asking me to read this book so that you can hear my review, get my reaction, and I must admit, I was hesitant. Because y'all know, super hyped books on the internet don't always agree with me, but I am a fantasy lover. I do enjoy me a fantasy novel, and I keep hearing super mixed things about this book. Some people hate it with a burning passion, other people love it and think it's the best book ever, and there's a lot of opinions in the middle. <laughs> I feel like every time a book is really polarizing, that's when my interest gets piqued. I kept trying to avoid reviews of this book so that I wouldn't be spoiled if I did eventually decide to read it, and I started to feel like I was missing out on a cultural movement by not reading this book and by having so many videos that I had sitting in my Watch Later playlist because I didn't want to spoil myself before I potentially read it in the future, and so I gave in. I bought myself a copy and I'm gonna read it. <laughs> and I thought, if I'm going to be reading it, I might as well document it. So that is this video. I'm gonna read Fourth Wing. I don't know anything about it. Y'all know, if you know me, that I prefer to go into books knowing little to nothing about what's coming. All I know is that it's fantasy, there are dragons, and I'm pretty sure there's a school setting for at least part of it. So I'm going in with the fewest number of expectations possible and we'll see what I think. So sit tight, get comfy, maybe get some tea or coffee, and hang out with me while I read Fourth Wing and share all my thoughts. Okay, so I have just finished the fifth chapter of Fourth Wing and I have some thoughts, shocking I know. I have been tabbing as I go and I would say I'm tabbing pretty extensively. 
the beginning has been, you know, semi heavy in the world building and establishing the magic system, but I also have a lot of other tabs. So I thought I would introduce you to my tabbing key so far for anyone who's interested as a bit of a follow up to my video explaining how and why I annotate, which I'll link in the description box if you missed it. So my annotation key so far is gender roles, character development or lack thereof, tropes, tropes, so many tropes, <laughs> quotes, relatable or funny, magic system, world building, and eye roll. So when I'm looking at the tabs I've used so far, I would say that the darkest blue is probably the most common. Second is probably the darkest green, which is world building, but the dark blue definitely shows up a little bit more, and that is eye roll. So if that gives you a little bit of an indication as to where I'm at in the first five chapters. A lot of eye rolling going on. So I don't want to talk too long for this first update. I just wanted to give you a bit of my initial impressions. I'll start with the positives. I'm enjoying the world building so far. I would love more of it, but I am personally a very world building heavy reader, or that's what I prefer in the books I read. I like a lot of world building and detailed world building, so I would happily take more. But I'm finding the world building we've received so far interesting. I think this world has a lot of potential, so I would love to get a little bit more into the weeds in terms of the political situation and why these two nations have been at war for 400 years and a little bit more about the structure of their society and so on and so forth. I'm also finding the magic system interesting so far and I'm sort of lumping all the information about the dragons in with the magic system. The dragons are really cool. I'm a fan. I feel like I haven't read a book with dragons in it for a hot minute, so I'm into it. I find the descriptions of the dragons quite interesting. I'm enjoying the lore we're starting to get around the dragons and the different types and how they tie into the magic system, how magic works in this world. I am enjoying that despite the fact that this is more of a warlike culture, that it seems like women are in positions of power, if not equally to men, at least in a higher percentage than in real life. It seems like there are quite a few female cadets in the Riders Quadrant where Violet is, and there's also quite a few women who seem to be higher up in command, including her mother. That's all working for me. Now onto the things that aren't working so much for me. Again, just initial impressions. This is an adult fantasy, but it definitely has a lot of YA fantasy tropes and vibes. That's why I made a whole tab for tropes, tropes, and more tropes, <laughs> because there's quite a few things coming up in here that just feel very YA. The chosen one is sort of the biggest trope that's kind of grinding my gears right now. Our main character is that quintessential plain and small and weak and unsuited to whatever situation she's been thrust into character, but she's also the most special <laughs> in one way or another. And that trope is very tired. I've read it so many times at this point that it just makes me roll my eyes every time it comes up again in a book, which is probably why I've used my eye roll tab so much. You know, she's the only one in the world with her very special hair and she is extra weak. She's not just normal weak for someone who's not suited to be a dragon rider. She's like next level weak. She's so small. It's ridiculous how tiny she is. She's, you know, super fair skinned and eyed and that makes her ugly and strange, I guess, in this world which is sort of leads into another thing that I'm not loving, which is the idea that a fair, light-haired, light-eyed, white girl who is petite and curvy is playing in this world. It just feels like a way to have a character that fits all of our beauty standards, but her still fit into the plain and yet all the guys are all over her kind of trope so that she's relatable. So that's not my favorite. And that, I guess, leads into another thing that's grinding my gears, which is something that if y'all have been watching my videos for a while, you will have heard me rant about before, so I'll try to rein it in. But this book seems to also be leading down the path of teeny tiny, eensy weensy, breakable, weak female MC with humongous, giant, muscly, huge, towering, rugged, manly men love interests. And I hate that trope so much. <laughs> I absolutely hate this fixation that we seem to have as a society of women being so tiny, they're almost childlike and men being an ogre. <laughs> it does not work for me. I find it very unsettling on many levels. And again, I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty here. If you wanna hear me rant about this in more detail, I would refer you to the video where I read and reviewed The Love Hypothesis. I'll link that down below as well if you missed it because I don't wanna repeat myself too much, but it's a trope that really drives me mad. I think it's harmful for women and for men. It just reinforces very strong strict gender roles and beauty standards and expectations. And it's harmful to anyone who doesn't fit into 
those categories, as well as to people who do fit into it who might feel fetishized. So I'm not a fan of that and that has already been coming up quite a bit, mostly in the descriptions of... I already forgot his name. What's his name? The one with the X. Zayden, but also a little bit in the descriptions of Dane, but Zayden in particular is definitely described as that trope to a T, which is making me not like him as a character. <laughs> so we'll see how that pans out. This passage in particular was really grinding my gears. Sorengale, he steps toward me and I look up and up. Good gods, I don't even reach his collarbone. He's massive. He has to be more than four inches over six feet tall. I feel exactly what Mira called me, fragile. I feel so fragile. It just feels like a soap opera and again very heavily tying into that trope of teeny tiny meansy meansy little MC in love with the most giant huge beast of a man and that drives me nuts. I'm also not loving how the author is sprinkling in some very modern sort of internet speak in amongst the slightly more elevated fantasy type language. There's just a couple moments that have really stood out to me that feel very awkward and strange. There's a point where she says double standard for the win, which feels very out of place in a world with dragons where they're all being conscripted to fight in a 400 year war and they seem to not have modern technology. There's also, let me guess, with a name like Sorengale, I bet you were the first to volunteer this year. And Violet says, I was more like voluntold. Here's another example that feels very internet speak and also YA coded. Even the diagonal scar that bisects his left eyebrow and marks the top corner of his cheek only makes him hotter, flaming hot, scorching hot, gets you into trouble and you like it level of hot. Suddenly I can't remember exactly why Mira told me not to fuck around outside my year group. Okay, we get it. He's very hot. He's flaming hot and scorching hot. Get you into trouble and you like it level of hot. Some of the descriptions of the male love interests feel a little bit fan fiction-y or Watt Patty, which is not bad in and of itself, but that's not what I personally am looking for when I pick up a book to read. We also already have a character growling by chapter three which is not a good sign. So much of the writing feels like it's leaning on YA tropes, but especially on YA writing conventions. This passage in particular felt incredibly YA to me. His gaze rakes over me with a desperate edge, like he needs to see every inch for himself. My knee is sore, I admit in a whisper, because it's Dane. Dane, whom I've known since we were five and six. Dane, whose father is one of my mother's most trusted advisors. Dane, who held me together when Myra left for the writer's quadrant and again when Brennan died. Like just repeating Dane over and over and over again in this pattern, it feels very dramatic <laughs> and very much in line with what I've read in YA fantasy, which again is totally fine. I want to make that clear. There's nothing wrong with YA writing styles, but I personally am not a huge fan of that sort of typical YA fantasy style of writing. It just doesn't really work for me. I find it a little too melodramatic personally to take it seriously. But again, that's personal preference. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the writing. It's just not my personal cup of tea. I'm also not super on board with the character development so far. It's not awful, but there are quite a few characters that feel very formulaic and so far very cardboard cutout. We have Jack, who is a cartoon villain. We have Zayden, who feels like a stereotypical enemies to lovers <laughs> stand-in. We have Dane, who is the stereotypical haven't seen them over the summer and they came back hot friends to lovers <laughs> stand-in. Violet herself so far feels very much like a typical tropey YA fantasy MC, very self-insert. She's quirky, she's sarcastic, she's smart. She's also the super special chosen one MC where, you know, everyone is interested in her from the beginning. In this case, it's because of who her mother is, but I'm sure later it will be because she has some sort of super special power that no one has ever seen. She's so special that everyone already wants her dead. She already has two mortal enemies by the end of chapter two, so if that says anything. So yeah, those are my thoughts for the first five chapters. I'm feeling very ambivalent about it so far, to be honest. You know, there's things I like, there's things that annoy me greatly, but, you know, I'd, I wouldn't say I hate it so far, but I'm also not, you know, super on board and really excited to keep reading. I'll put my prediction out there now, just for fun, that I see Violet, you know, being the underdog, having some challenges, maybe surviving attempted murder. 
a couple times, but then she, you know, is an unlikely victor at the threshing. She gets bonded with the dragon right away and everyone's shocked because, you know, she's the weakling and she has an incredibly strong bond with the dragon, stronger than anyone's ever had before. And she develops a completely unheard of power that no one has ever had before. And that makes her vital to the war effort. And she gets conscripted early and leaves the school and is on the front lines and discovers some sort of secret about the war that she then has to grapple with seeing, you know, her own mother and her own people as the villains, and she's going to save the day. That's my prediction. And on the way, she's going to be in a love triangle with Dane and Zayden. And she's probably going to ultimately go with Zayden, because I feel like most readers seem to enjoy the bad boy enemies to lovers thing more than the friends to lovers. So I feel like that's what the author's going to play into, but we'll see. Maybe one of the more prominent characters we're getting to know now, maybe even Rhiannon, will die at some point in a shocking twist. Those are my predictions. <laughs> so we'll see. I'm going to go keep reading and I'll be back when I finish chapter 10 since that's approximately a quarter of the way through the book. I'm a little bit scared, but trying to be hopeful. <laughs> Hey, I'm back. I just finished chapter 10, which means I'm officially a quarter of the way through Fourth Wing. And I feel like not much has happened, to be honest. I felt like I'd have more to say when I finished another five chapters, but things are going pretty slowly, to be honest. We're not getting a huge amount more in the way of detailed world building and really not getting too much more with the dragons or the magic system. We're getting a lot of sort of the intermediary scenes. We're not focusing so much on the actual school parts, the training. Those parts are normally sort of brushed over unless it's a bigger event. We mostly seem to be spending as much page count as possible on developing the potential romantic relationships between the main character Violet and her childhood best friend Dane and the enemies to lovers insert Zayden. It's just feeling really repetitive to me. It feels super slow paced and we're basically just going from scene to scene to scene of Violet running into either Dane or Zayden and them having a sexually charged 
conversation where her internal monologue is entirely focused on how hot they are or how tall they are or how infuriating they are while still being hot. And I'm just not getting much out of this, you know? I'm not really sure where it's going. There's not a huge amount of plot happening. I can't say that I can really identify any major themes yet. It just doesn't feel like there's a lot of substance. And I'm trying to reserve judgment because I'm only a quarter of the way through, but I'm feeling the small, tiny little ember of hope that I had at the beginning slowly dwindle and die as chapter after chapter goes on with very little to show for it. I have slightly shifted my tabs as I've continued to read, which is something that I tend to do and something I mentioned in my annotations video. I removed the color that I assigned to gender roles at the beginning. I thought there might be a little bit more commentary on the gender roles and stereotypes within this world and dynamics, power imbalances if they exist. There's been basically no commentary on that whatsoever. So I've left that color open to be reassigned to something else if something else comes up. And I've added one new color, which is solely for the number of times the author uses the expression that a mouth curved into a smile, specifically curved into a smile or another part of their face curved with their smile. It came up a couple times at the beginning, but I didn't take any particular notice of it, but it started to show up so often that I couldn't focus on anything else. It was incredibly distracting. So I added a tab and I've started tracking it and counting it. Since I started counting it, it's been five times, but I need to go back and read the first hundred pages or at least skim them again to know how many I missed. But it's very frustrating. And there's actually been a couple moments like that where turns of phrase are used excessively and it just is starting to feel like lazy writing and or a lack of editing. Uh, there's one example where at the end of two chapters in a row, so end of of chapter six, the last sentence or the two last sentences are a slow smile spreads across my face. I know how to survive. And then the end of the very next chapter, chapter seven, and these are not very long chapters. End of chapter seven, the final tiny little paragraph starts with a slow smile spreads across my face and it continues. And that's just such an odd choice to me to end two subsequent chapters with the exact same turn of phrase. And it's just something that would be so easily caught by an editor and changed to something else so that it wouldn't raise a red flag and be something noticeable and distracting to the reader. It just feels like there's not a lot of effort going into just little things like that and very repetitive language and same expressions and terms and descriptors being used over and over and over and over again. And that's really adding to the impression I'm getting that this is very YA coded, even if it isn't officially considered a YA novel in every way that counts to this point, this is a YA fantasy. There's a lot of really just eye-rolling moments, you know, just descriptions of the characters and the continued focus on how teeny tiny she is and how massive everyone else is in this book, apparently. For example, the beginning of chapter nine, we have, I'm so completely screwed. Zayden stepped forward, all six foot everything of him. There's also something that I'm not going to, or maybe I'll talk about it in a little spoiler section for people who have read the book, because the main character is doing something that I find to be incredibly morally questionable. And it feels like the book is framing it as a badass girl boss moment that we're supposed to be like, damn, you're so clever. Good for you for figuring out a way to succeed. And it doesn't feel that way. I'm questioning why she's making the decision she's making on multiple levels and not on board with it in a moral or ethical sense, as well as a logic sense. So I'll talk about that in a minute in a spoiler section. But before I do that, just a final couple thoughts. The repetitive nature of this is not only in the overuse of certain expressions or words or descriptors, but also just in the dialogue and the interactions. Something that's come up over and over again is that Violet vacillates between admitting that she is literally the weakest person to have ever been born in this world, and yet she gets irrationally angry when someone else points out that she is small or weak or frail or or brittle, <laughs> which just, why? I don't know. And it happens over and over and over again. And it's starting to really irk me from one page to another. On page 85, we get, he arches a black brow and sheathes his dagger. Like I couldn't possibly pose a threat to him, which only serves to piss me off more. But then on the very next page, page 86, we get, the futility of even trying to defend myself against him is laughable. 
Okay, so you acknowledge that it's completely futile for you to try to fight back because he is so much stronger than you and also has magic. But one page ago, you were getting irrationally angry because he was acting like you couldn't pose a threat to him. Yet you acknowledge that you cannot pose a threat to him. Make it make sense. <laughs> There's still an excessive amount of focusing, really fetishizing Violet's tininess, how frail she is, breakable she is, brittle she is, tiny and small, comes up constantly. She's thinking it, other people say it to her, it never ends. And then on the flip side of that, the constant obsessive fetishizing focus on how huge and tall and massive and muscular and threatening the men in this world are. I'm not going to harp on it yet again, but it is just something that is a huge pet peeve for me in books and it's really used to excess here. I'm going to wrap up this update, but before before I do, I am going to do a quick spoiler section. So if you don't want to be spoiled, jump to this time or use the chapters down below to go to the end of the spoiler. I'll have this frame up on the screen for the whole time I'm talking about spoilers. So you can also just scrub through until this frame around me disappears. So for those of you who are willing to hear the spoilers, this whole little moment of Violet using a variety of poisons on her sparring partners to disorient them or make them violently ill so that she can beat them does not sit well with me. I don't see how that's ethical in any way, especially her not having any idea about any of these people's individual health status or whether, I mean, I don't know if they have medication in this world, but you know, if they're taking an herb for a previous injury, or maybe they have some sort of health condition that would make them more susceptible to whatever poison she's using on them, she could kill them inadvertently. And I realize in this world, killing their fellow students is not really seen as that big of a deal. And potentially some of these people would have attempted to kill her if she hadn't poisoned them. I understand that. But I just don't feel like it's this super badass bitch girl boss moment that they're trying to sell us <laughs> that Violet is poisoning and drugging all of her opponents so that they either hallucinate or vomit repeatedly and violently or can't see straight or walk straight over and over and over again. And my very first thought after thinking that that seemed like a really shitty thing to do and was not ethical in any way and did not make me like or root for Violet was the thought that her doing this, sure, might mean that she wins these bouts of hand-to-hand -hand combat while they're training, but it also means that she's not learning anything or getting better. And she knows that if she doesn't die while she's in training, she's going to be sent to the front to fight in a war where, you know, she won't be able to poison every person she fights. And then she'll be woefully ill-prepared to actually fight someone and not die. So just on every level, moral, ethical, logical, it doesn't make any sense. And at least maybe one chapter later, it's pointed out that it doesn't make sense from a logical standpoint point because she's not learning how to actually spar properly. And maybe I shouldn't expect characters in the book to point out how it's not ethical because, you know, they're reading out lists of the number of people who have died every single day. They don't seem hugely concerned with murder, but you know, it still doesn't sit super well with me. So yeah. I'm really struggling to connect to Violet in general, and that whole little section just made it worse for me. It didn't feel clever and like her outsmarting her problem. It just felt really gross and wrong and not very smart in the long run. So that's my spoiler thought. So I'm going to wrap up this update. I will be back when I finish the next quarter of the book. So when I'm halfway through to give you another update, I still have a small amount of hope that this book can turn it around and deliver more on the things that I think make fantasy interesting and exciting and worth reading, which is all the political intrigue and the world building and the magic systems and the themes that can be explored through it. But I am a little concerned by how the first quarter has gone, that it's just going to keep going down this track. Very repetitive, very little plot or substance, and a lot of describing people's eyes and how tall they are and how hard their muscles are over and over again. So... We shall see. Okay, bye.
Hey, so I just finished chapter 21, which means I'm just a little bit past halfway. And once again, unsurprisingly, I have thoughts that have been slowly percolating in my memory palace. <laughs> so let's get into it. As you can already see, I'm filming outside for this update. It is a beautiful day. It's been gray and rainy for about a week and a half. And today was beautiful and sunny and warm. So I wanted to spend time outside and we'll see how the audio goes. I literally have three <laughs> microphones recording me. I have my lav and two backup mics, so hopefully at least one of them sounds okay, but I apologize if you can hear the birds and people vrooming by on their motorcycles and possibly someone starting to cut their lawn. It is what it is. But I am happy to report that the last little section I read was by far my favorite of the book so far. Things are looking up, which I'm very glad about. This is not to say that all of my pet peeves have just vanished into midair in a puff of smoke, but they have diminished enough that I'm able to look past them a little bit more and focus on the things that I do like about this story, which right now is pretty much mostly only the dragons. But there are way more dragons dragons in this last portion of the book. We actually get to meet dragons, learn their names, get some dialogue with them, learn more about how dragon society works, different types of dragons. I'm a fan. The main dragon that we get the most interaction with is the best, in my opinion, like a super ancient, super grumpy grandpa type dragon and he's fantastic. There is a lot less focusing on how sexy various characters are. Not to say that it's completely disappeared because it hasn't, but there's less of that, which I appreciate. We're getting a tiny bit more history of this world, of this specific country, a little bit more about the political climate, a little bit more about the rebellion, which is fascinating. And we've been introduced to a couple new characters and had a little bit more page time for some of the other minor characters that I'm a big fan of, like Riddick and Rhiannon, who are two of my favorite characters. I think I wrote a note at one point that that I would rather either of them be the MC, and I still stand by that. Violet is not my favorite character in this book, but she's a little less irritating, so I'll give her that. We also are getting a little less Dane, which is great because I find him quite irritating as well, and we're spending more time with what's his name? What is his name again? We're spending a little bit more time with Zayden, but he is a little less fill-in-the-blank, broody, dangerous evil dude, and starting to have a little bit more personality. Some of that personality is still very fill-in-the-blank, stereotypical love interest in a YA fantasy romance, but at least there's a little bit more substance there, and I'm hoping we'll get more. Liam, who is a new character we've been introduced to in this section of the book, is fantastic. I kind of wish he was a love interest because he's great. But through him, we're learning more about Zayden's background and what his childhood might have been like, which is nice, again, for more character depth. I was correct in a couple of my assumptions about where some portions of the story were going to go. It was pretty predictable in a couple different ways. And again, I don't want to get too heavy into spoilers. Maybe I'll do another spoiler section in this update. But on the one hand, it is satisfying to be able to pick up on the things that are coming next and to be right about it. But if it's too easy to do that, then it just feels frustrating because there's no suspense. There's no curiosity because you know exactly what's going to happen and then it happens. And that's not satisfying if you don't have to work for it you know? But overall, feeling much better about things. I'm sort of scoffing and guffawing a little bit more, mostly due to grumpy Grandpa Dragon. <laughs> yes, that is his real name. And Riddick is quite funny and entertaining. I enjoy that both Riddick and Rhiannon are bisexual. It's awesome. Once again, I wish either of them, or maybe both, trading off point of views, were our main character because I would have loved a bisexual or in some way in the LGBTQIA plus community MC. I'm also starting to wonder if Violet might have Ehlers-Danos syndrome. I might be mispronouncing that. I'll put the name on the screen so you know what I'm talking about, but that is a condition of the bones and connective tissues, as far as I know, that causes you to be more flexible to a pretty extreme degree, but then also makes you much more at risk of injury. And I think, I'm starting to think that that's what's going on with her and that because of the setting, they don't have the level of scientific or medical knowledge to give her an official diagnosis, so it's not named. And I kind of wish that that had been made a little bit more clear earlier on, because as y'all have already seen, I spent the whole first part of the book being super frustrated with her constantly referring to herself as literally the most fragile, weak, breakable person on the planet. It just seemed like hyperbole. But if she has Ehlers-Danos syndrome, that makes a lot more sense because they do have significantly more brittle bones and loose, you know, fragile ligaments 
and muscles. That's my working theory. I'm going to look that up and see if the author's talked about that anywhere. I would be curious to know if the author herself has the condition and she's writing from her own experience. That would be really interesting. But that thought is making me feel a little bit better about the way that she's constantly talking about herself. It just makes more sense. It's less so her being extremely dramatic and more so her having an actual condition that does in fact make her extremely more brutal in comparison to other people. There also seems to be a non-binary character, again not named, but they use they them pronouns. And we have a deaf character who is a scribe that's come up in the last couple chapters. So we also have signing in the book, which is really fun. I'm enjoying the little bit more diversity we're getting. I'm enjoying sort of widening the scope meeting more people, doing new things, having way more dragon time. <laughs> because like I said, the dragons are by far the best part of this book and a little bit less pining and over the top descriptions of characters' eyes and muscles and height and how hard their chest is and so on and so forth. I don't think that stuff is completely gone. I imagine that will continue until she ends up hooking up with one of the love interests or both. I have a feeling who the end game love interest is going to be and I'm sure we will experience much more flirting until they eventually just do it. But as of right now, it's reduced a little bit and I appreciate that. The plot is still going by quite slowly and we're still not getting as much detailed world building and political intrigue as I would like. But I feel like in the last couple chapters, we've had a couple breadcrumbs of further political intrigue. So I'm hopeful that that is going to continue to blossom and develop as we go on. But yeah, overall, I'm feeling much more positive. This is the most positive I felt about this book so far. So I'm really hoping that that continues through the rest of the book. We shall see, I suppose. There has been the addition of one more trope that I cannot stand, which is sort of a twist on faded mates. If you know, you know, one of my least favorite tropes. So not loving that, but so far the twist on it is making it slightly less uncomfortable and irksome. Again, we shall see how it develops. But yeah, I think those are all my non-spoiler thoughts so far. Now that I've gotten to the halfway point, like I said, feeling much more positive. So I'm going to do a quick spoiler section. If you don't want spoilers, skip to the next section. Once again, it'll be on the timeline. It'll be in the cards down below. I'll also have the frame around me that indicates it's spoilers so you can scrub through or mute me until the frame goes away. Whatever you like. If you don't want spoilers, they're coming. I warned you. Okay, spoilers up to the halfway point. I already forgot what I was going to talk about in the spoiler section. What was I going to talk about? So the Fated Mates situation with Zayden, I do appreciate the twist that it's actually their dragons who are mated and that's what sort of connects them and bonds them. I think that's a little bit more interesting than just, you know, them being fated to be together for some reason. I feel like I would have been more on board with sort of this switch from Zayden, you know, hating her and wanting to kill her to realizing he has to keep her alive because if she dies, he might also die. It would have been more effective if he'd seemed to actually want to kill her at any point in the book because really other than the first time they meet, he never felt like he actually wanted to kill her. He had so many chances and he never did. It seemed like that was never really on his radar, which is fine. But I think because it was framed that way for so long and then after the switch happens, they try to make it seem like it's this huge shift that's happened in their relationship that he no longer wants to murder her. He's going to protect her. But he kind of always felt like he wanted to protect her and never really felt like he wanted to murder her. So it feels a little bit empty <laughs> in a way. It's just not that interesting of a dynamic shift because it really Really doesn't feel very different. So my prediction was that Violet was going to bond with a feather tail dragon or the gigantic black dragon that they said hasn't been seen in a really long time and is ancient and incredibly powerful. And if you've read the book, you know I was right, except that I didn't guess that she would be so extra incredibly special that she would be the first person in all of history to bond to two dragons. <laughs> she got both the feather tail and the gigantic black dragon and is now going to be like the most powerful rider of all time. So that's fun. <laughs> Again, really playing into that trope of the MC being just super overpowered compared to everyone else. And even just in general, outside of her bonding with two dragons and the fact that that's probably going to lead to her having pretty intense powers. She also has apparently become super nimble and fast and amazing with 
throwing knives. Like she has amazing aim and is actually quite formidable in her agility and fighting acumen, even though she's not big or strong. And that felt a little bit flimsy to me. That just reinforces one of my issues that I have with sort of YA fantasy main characters, which is often that they portray themselves as being so much a fish out of water, so unsuited to whatever they're having to face. And they really have to push themselves to be able to succeed. But they often also have all these innate abilities that other people don't have that make them actually the most well suited to whatever they're doing more so than anyone else possibly could be. And it's just, it doesn't feel realistic developing a character who doesn't feel real because they don't really have any flaws or areas where they're truly weak. The areas where they're weak are only areas that they haven't realized how strong they are in just yet. So not my favorite. I'm also glad that Dane has kind of shown his ass <laughs> and that she's realized she's not into him because Dane is so annoying and very patronizing. And I would love for him to just be scorched by a dragon so that he's no longer in the narrative. <laughs> Sorry, Dane, but like, it's getting tired. Someone has started cutting their grass because of course they have. So I'm gonna get going. I can't think of anything else I wanna share about this portion, but I'm feeling pretty optimistic. So I will be back in a little bit and share an update for the next quarter of the book. And hopefully things will continue on this trajectory because that would be nice. I don't know why I keep doing this. <laughs> okay, bye. Hello, welcome back, my friends. I have just finished to the three quarter mark. I'm feeling very conflicted on this book so far. It's definitely getting better in many ways as it continues on. There's a lot of things about it that I quite like, but there's still those nagging, nagging bits and bobs that are really getting to me. You know, the chosen one main character, that is a very heavily used trope in this book. I was kind of holding out hope that when and if Violet's signet power manifested, it would be something mundane and she would have to do some personal growth, realizing that even with all the other things that make her super duper special, she's still just a normal person and maybe strength of character and courage and other such personal traits that she has are what makes her special, what gives her value and makes her good at the things she does and not the fact that she's just like the most super special person to have ever been born. I was holding out hope for it. I didn't really expect that to happen. I, I was expecting her to continue to be the most super special person to have ever been born. And that's what happened. But I, the part of me was just rooting for the less conventional option. Maybe somehow her super specialness will lead to character growth in the last quarter of the book, but I'm not really sure how. So we shall see. To be honest, I don't have a huge number of notes or things to talk about about that section of the book. Pretty much the th only thing that kept coming back up for me over and over again was that I really hate the nickname Violence. The love interest likes to call Violet Violence. And it's just the worst nickname ever. It's so dumb. I'm sorry. It's so dumb. I hate it with all my soul. Every time he calls her that, and it's supposed to be this like sultry, like I have a special nickname for you, violence. And I think I'm supposed to find it hot. And every time I just guffaw because it's so silly and stupid. And in the last chapter I just read, there's a bit of a tie back where Violet is talking about how she's struggling with the fact that she's had to become a violent person, never having dreamed of having to be a violent person when she thought she would become a scribe, how she's really turning into that nickname that he gave her. And it just feels like the author chose that nickname just for that moment. So it would be a like, aha moment where everything comes together and we're all like, damn, you're so clever. But that's really not how it felt. It just felt a little cheap <laughs> to me. And, you know, that just kind of continues my general struggle with a lot of the language choices 
hear terminally online speak from time to time, which feels very out of place. So many more instances of lips curving into a smile. Many, many descriptions of rock hard chests and piercing eyes and giant heights. I feel like they sort of dissipated a bit in the last quarter and in this quarter they were back with a vengeance. The sexual tension is reaching an unbearable peak. I actually think that where I left off is the start of maybe our first scene of the book, which I am curious about. I wonder how smutty it's gonna get because like I said, my understanding was that this was adult fantasy, but it really seems to be YA fantasy in pretty much every way that counts. So I do wonder how explicit the smut scene is gonna go, you know? How hard are we gonna go here? I have a feeling that no matter how explicit it is or how non-explicit, I'm going to be cringing through the whole thing, possibly with a couple eye rolls thrown in for good measure, but we, we'll see. I don't, you know, I don't scoff at a good smut scene. I'm not too good for a good smut scene. I'm just not sure that I buy the chemistry here. I'm also sort of of the mind that if a book is really gonna lean into the sexy smutty angle, then you should be getting a smut scene earlier than almost 400 pages into the book. That seems a little extreme. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm gonna leave it there and I will see you one final time once I finish the book for all my final thoughts. I'm gonna go inside now because it's getting really cold. <laughs> Okay, so I finished. I am done, fourth wing. And honestly, I kind of feel like I was just brutally and suddenly awoken from a trance by having ice cold water dumped all over my head. <laughs> because I feel like by the halfway three quarter point in this book, I was starting to be a little bit gaslit by this book. <laughs> I was developing Stockholm syndrome hard. I really was trying to find the diamond in the rough, to find something to love about the story, to get myself invested. I was clinging at straws, y'all. But as soon as I read that final sentence on the final page, it's like I just snapped awake and remembered all of the things that I did not enjoy about this book. And then it was just like a wave of disappointment where I realized <laughs> that even though there were some little gems, you know, some, some hidden gems in here, there were some things that I didn't hate. They were so overpowered by all of the things things that were huge missed opportunities or just so poorly executed and it's depressing. So how I'm going to structure this final review is I'm going to talk about as many things as I can without spoilers first, and then I'm going to do a spoiler section because there's a few little rants I have to have and I just can't rant effectively while I'm being censored, <laughs> trying to keep things spoiler free. So I think I'm going to start with the positives because there are fewer of them. 
<laughs> and also because um, I just want to get them out of the way so I can focus on what I'm going to spend the majority of my time talking about. So positives in this book, the dragons. I liked them. I did. They were by far the most interesting characters. Their society seemed really interesting and I was incredibly disappointed by how little we actually got to learn about their culture, more about their life cycles, just everything, you know, very little in terms of that. And that was sad, but I feel like the most chuckling I did, the most that I ever had a smile on my face while reading this book was reading the dragons being sassy or grumpy as the case may be. All great. Enjoy the dragons very much so. So that is a positive. <laughs> Other positives. Um, the... <laughs> My mind went blank. I couldn't think of another one. I did not hate all of the characters. There were a couple characters I enjoyed from the beginning. Unfortunately, none of them had nearly as much page time as they deserved. Rhiannon, Riddick, Liam, all characters I quite enjoyed. I'm adding Liam into this trio of MCs that I would have enjoyed reading about more so than Violet. So clearly the author can write fun characters that you can relate to and root for and find endearing and funny and fun. Unfortunately, our main character and the other <laughs> prominent characters in this book were not like that. I will give Zayden a little bit of a point, like half a point in the likable characters category because he did get a little bit more development as the book went on. He did get a little bit better. He had more complexity. He wasn't just a cardboard cutout of an enemies to lovers, male love interest trope. He turned into slightly more of a real person, but it was just, again, one of those things where as I was reading, every time we got a crumb that added to Zayden's development, I was like, thank goodness. Here we go. We are getting more development. Injected into my veins as a character-driven reader, I need all of the development that I can get. But then, you know, in retrospect, as I think about it, it was the bare minimum. Did it even hit the bare minimum of development for a love interest? No. No, it did not. There was not nearly enough. I looked it up and apparently Violet does in fact have Eiler's Danlos syndrome, which I still might be mispronouncing. And apparently the author also has it. So that's nice. She's writing the representation from her own personal experience, which is great. It also explains her super special unique hair because apparently premature grain of the hair is also a symptom, which I did not know. So that makes me forgive the super special, no one else has it in the world hair thing a little bit. And like I said earlier, when I started to suspect that she might have this syndrome, that does help me to not be quite so irritated by the constant reinforcing of how she's the weakest, frailest person to have ever existed. It makes a little bit more sense. And I cannot and will not speak to the disability rep because I don't have eiler stanlos syndrome, so I cannot say if it's good rep or not. Let me know in the comments if you do have it or have a similar disability, how you felt about the rep if you read this book. But I'm just putting it out there that I did look it up and apparently I was right and the author also has it. So that is also a positive. And then the only other positive for me really was some of the core concepts in terms of the world building and the political situation. I specifically say the core concepts because the execution was not at all what I was hoping for. I think there were a lot of missed opportunities. There was a lot of potential here with this world building that was just not delivered by this book, but I did enjoy some of the folklore um, that we got very little of. I did enjoy, you know, the different types of mythical creatures. I thought the magic system was interesting. I was interested in the political tensions between these neighboring kingdoms, although again, the execution was just not up to par. It was very obvious from the beginning, very clearly telegraphed what the sort of big twist about their 400 year war was going to be, which was pretty frustrating to, you know, wait for the book to catch up with the reader because I'm pretty sure literally everyone who read this book saw what was coming from maybe chapter five at the latest. That's sort of a, a plus and a minus where there were some interesting ideas. There were some aspects of that that I liked. I think the core theme of the book that we only really arrived at very near the end was an interesting theme and certainly worth exploring, but that this book did not do nearly enough to explore the theme that I think it was trying to. Just very surface level and very much just saying the theme, <laughs> just having quotes of people just saying exactly what the author is getting at instead of it being woven throughout the story and, you know, shown to us rather than told us and also interspersed throughout the entire narrative instead of just shoved in from time to time. And by time to time, I mean probably twice. Yeah, I think those are all the positives. I'm trying, I'm really trying to think.
but I think I think that's it. Moving on to the negatives, again, non-spoiler, there are many. I've already touched on through the positives some of my major negatives, which are the main character being not very likable and not very well developed. Same thing with the main love interest, Zayden, not super likable for most of the book, not very well developed for most of the book. Some of the other main characters like Dane, very cardboard cutout, stereotypical, a character built out of tropes just like Zayden and Violet. Just all the most popular tropes from every YA fantasy novel to exist and from romance as well, just sort of slap dashed together to create characters. <laughs> the world building situation, how it was explored. I mentioned in one of the first updates that a lot of the world building was being delivered through Violet just reciting history books verbatim as a way to calm herself down. That luckily slowly dissipated, but the way that the world building was introduced, the way that more of the history was introduced was often pretty awkward and heavy-handed. It felt very inserted into the narrative. And of course, often we learn something right before we needed to know it instead of things being incorporated in a more natural way so that when they come up in the narrative, it's something we've already learned, but it doesn't feel like they told us just so that we could understand the next scene. And once you start to realize that's the pattern, it also makes it very easy to know what's going to happen next, because as soon as something's introduced, you know it's going to become relevant in the next two or three pages. The world building just didn't go deep enough. The exploration of the political tensions didn't go deep enough. The central theme was not explored to a level that I was hoping for. Not every book has to be super heavy on the thematic content. It doesn't have to be incredibly deep. It can just be about, you know, action and dragons and, you know, horny people being horny. That's totally fine. I think it's just disappointing to read something that certainly would have had potential with maybe a little bit more time to develop it, a little bit more effort there. A lot of editing. I think I also mentioned in a couple of the updates that the writing was just not really doing it for me. That continued through to the end. Very awkward insertions of internet speak, slang from my childhood, which is weird to read in a book that seems to be set in basically medieval times. They don't have electricity or a rollerball pen not been invented yet. And also just super repetitive. You know, the dialogue followed a very predictable pattern. There were many turns of phrase and specific words, many, many repetitive conversations that were essentially the same conversation that characters had already had so many times before, just playing out again and again with no new information. We also have a lot of little quirks with the writing, things like the author often would try to punctuate what a character was saying by separating each word by a period because they're very intense, which is just kind of annoying to read. And the writing style in general was often deeply melodramatic. Again, all of these things, the incredibly tropey writing, the writing style itself, the super internet speak, so many of these things really contributed to the feeling that this is solidly in the YA fantasy category, which I already talked about that not being an issue, but the fact that it was mismarketed or is being, you know, miscategorized as adult fantasy is pretty misleading considering everything about it is YA fantasy. On top of all of those, maybe slightly more minor writing qualms, there were also quite a few plot holes. There seemed to be rules and conventions and aspects of the society that changed randomly whenever they needed to to suit the narrative. There were so many aspects of this world and how the school worked in particular that made very little sense. One of the examples that is really jarring is that they are constantly talking about how many of their borders are being breached, how many reinforcements they need, how there aren't enough riders to continue to fight this war, how they're in desperate need of people, and yet the entire system of training people to become riders involves killing them off willy-nilly at all times, you know, allowing cadets to kill each other basically whenever they want to, putting them through so many challenges and people just randomly, you know, dropping like flies and that being seen as no big deal whatsoever when they need people on the ground. Maybe this person fails a test and maybe that means you really don't want to bond them with the dragon because they'll just fall off and what's the point in that? And they'll, you know, put the dragon in harm's way, fine. But if they fail a challenge, maybe then they're sent to the infantry so they can still be a body fighting in the war. And when they die, it's dying in a battle or to protect a village of people so that they don't have their village burned down or so that babies aren't eaten by griffins or whatever. Instead of just dying because they fell off a spinning log in a challenge or were murdered by some random other cadet in a hallway because they looked at them wrong over breakfast. It just feels like such a waste of fighters that they really don't have any right to be throwing away like this. It's ridiculous. It was just a frustrating read for many reasons. I also really hated the names of almost everyone. <laughs> 
and everything. It very much felt like the kinds of names that I gave characters in the stories that I wrote when I was 10. And the biggest offender in the naming category is Zayden's nickname for Violet. Calling her Violence, like that is a cute, quirky nickname. And then it continuing to come back over and over again in the narrative where she's wrestling with the fact that she's had to become a violent person. And she at one moment is trying to hype herself up to live up to her nickname. And then in another moment, she's mourning the fact that her nickname has become so apt because she's become such a violent person. And it just, it was supposed to be deeper than it was. It was supposed to be more profound than it was. What it was was annoying as hell. Violence is not a cute nickname. I'm sorry. It's just not. If someone gave me a nickname like violence, I would excommunicate them. <laughs> it's not doing what Rebecca thinks it's doing. At least a third of the dark blue tabs I used for my eye rolling annotations were for when Zayden called Violet Violence because just no. Please stop make it end. But she really truly is the most special, most powerful, most chosen one of chosen ones, one of my least favorite tropes. And of course, her tininess, her frailness, her perfect femininity is perfectly contrasted by the super tall giant, hard as nails, muscly, mysterious, gruff, arrogant, violent and scary men that surround her. But of course, they're soft for MC. They would do anything to protect MC because she is special and they would never hurt her, even though they could because they're so huge and powerful, but they would never hurt her because they're in love with her because everyone is. So it's my favorite, truly. So spoiler section, like rapid fire version. All of the things I was talking about in the unspoiler version, but spoilered. <laughs> Dane is the worst, okay? He is so annoying. From the beginning, I knew there was something up with him. And the fact that Violet never once thought that he could have been reading her memories every time he touched her, even though he explicitly told her that he could read memories when he touched people. And he already made it very clear that he was willing to demand to see her memories. Very silly. I don't know how Violet is apparently the smartest person to have ever existed. The fact that it's claimed near the end that Violet has an unparalleled knowledge of poisons. I'm sorry, what? You're telling me that people who are trained as healers might not know more about poisons than a 20 year old? You know, maybe a scribe who spent their entire 80 year lifetime studying poisons? No, none of them know as much about poisons as Violet. So that's just that. Of course, just adding to the whole, she is the most special, the most powerful, the most amazing to have ever lived thing is that she gets two dragons, not just one, two. And the fact that nobody can tell that Andara is a baby dragon is just baffling. Like, I'm sorry, she's significantly smaller than all the other ones. She's very soft and fluffy, like a puppy. She also acts like a puppy. And then I'm not exactly sure how they think they're going to hide the fact that she was a baby when she grows and becomes a full-sized dragon. Like it's going to be pretty obvious that she wasn't full grown yet and therefore was a baby. So the fact that they even risked bringing her around humans means they've now revealed that feather tails are the babies, which would be fine if they wanted to do that. But it seemed like that was a secret that no one could share. But now everyone's going to know because a bunch of people saw her when she was a baby. And, you know, unless they hide her away for the rest of her life, which is apparently centuries, even though she's bonded to someone that she's supposed to stay close to, they're all going to know. So why? There was no good explanation at any point why she she was brought along. She just was and put at risk over and over again. Please explain. The whole faded mates thing through the dragons was, like I mentioned, annoying, but at least slightly tempered by the fact that they weren't the faded mates. It was their dragons that they were bonded to. But then when they got supernaturally horned up because their dragons were was a whole other level of disturbing. It just completely wiped any of the benefit of the doubt that I gave the author for using that trope, because please no, I don't want to read about people barely holding on to tearing each other's clothes off because their bonded dragons are getting it on. Like feeling what they felt and like feeling all their emotions and their lust, that just, I'm sorry, that's not okay. I'm not okay with that. I wish I could wipe it from my brain. Okay, so I had to move inside because it was getting really dark out. So we're talking about spoilers and I have more things to share. The whole twist that Navarre is actually on the bad side of history, that they rewrote history to fit with their narrative and that they're actually actively harming their neighbors and not helping them, even though they're being attacked and destroyed by these evil beings who have too much power. Literally the least surprising twist that this book could have. Have. It was so obvious from like, I don't know, page 10 maybe that that was going to happen, that there was more to that conflict than meets the eye. And very quickly, it was incredibly obvious. At least the leadership of Navarro were the bad guys. The fact that so many of the pre-chapter excerpts from the history book are specifically from a history book called Navarre 
an unedited history, as if that's not the most obvious hint that the history is in fact edited in the entire world. I even highlighted and underlined it at one point with my very insightful note, lol, sure Jan, because like, first of all, we all know that every history book ever has been edited and is from the perspective of the victor, that's how it works. But also like literally calling it an unedited history is just... I'm sorry, was I supposed to not pick up on that? Was it supposed to be a secret? Which just sort of ties into all of the twist shock reveals, like the fact that Zayden apparently doesn't actually want to kill Violet. He's actually super into her and has been from the very beginning. Like that was not a twist. That was very obvious. Zayden literally did not once try to kill Violet. He didn't even try to harm her even a little bit. He wasn't even particularly mean or rude to her. He pretty much was flirting and protecting her and helping her and in no way being murdered towards her from the get-go. So the fact that that was supposed to be like a shocking turnaround and that it continued for so many hundreds of pages, Violet constantly asking him when he was finally going to decide if he was going to murder her or not. Like, he clearly is not going to murder you. Chill out. None of us are shocked that he didn't end up murdering you and that he, in fact, is into you. Speaking of it being super obvious that Navarre are the bad guys, why are the dragons supporting them? Are we going to learn in the next book that somehow they've enslaved the dragons somehow and they've been forced to help them? Because the idea that the dragons know that the Venon are real and that they have wyverns and that they're just terrorizing people in the surrounding lands and they're doing nothing about it and they're helping the leadership of Navarre to keep out neighboring people and um, not help them in any way. We didn't get a huge amount of detail into how the dragons actually conduct themselves when they're on their own, how their society works, what they actually value. There's actually a line at one point where the dragon says like, don't tell me what I value. And it's like, okay, cool, sure. Sh sh maybe she shouldn't tell you what you value, but you could share just so that we, you know, learn more about you <laughs> and dragon kind. No, you don't want to? Okay, cool. We'll just live in ignorance. That's fine. Totally, totally fine. Maybe they just don't care. But then it seems once they are in a situation to be fighting the Venon and the Wyverns that they believe that the Wyverns are abominations that should be destroyed and they seem to really hate them. So why are they not trying to destroy them? Also, just the fact that Violet is the strongest wielder that anyone has seen in at least a century. You know, she has the power to control lightning and also to stop time, which like are powers that no one has ever had. And also her power is specifically foretold to be the one power that can defeat the Wyverns and the Vernon. And, you know, that's her destiny because she's the most special chosen one. She not only bonded with the one remaining black dragon, the most massive dragon, the most powerful other than the general's dragon, but she also got a second dragon because she's such a badass. She's so amazing and special that she gets two and that's literally never happened in the history of ever. Just, you know, like, why? I just want a main character who's a normal person, normal within their world. Can they just be middling? Like they do okay. You know, they don't win every battle. They just, they just kind of exist. And they're interesting because they're a complex human, you know, and the world they live in is interesting, but they don't have to be the greatest hero that has ever been foretold. And the only one of their kind to have ever existed. Like, I'm just tired, okay? I don't want it anymore. <laughs> I've been reading books with this trope since I was about 11. It's been 20 years, okay? I've had enough. Please no more. At the, what was it, the presentation when all the cadets are introduced to dragons for the first time, standing in formation in front of a couple dragons that are hanging out on the wall, just being intimidating and large and scary. And one of them gets freaked out by being so close to a dragon and just turns and runs screaming. And I just imagine them like flailing their arms and running like a cartoon. And then they get scorched by a dragon and there's just like a scorch mark on the earth and they're completely disintegrated. I started laughing a little bit because it just felt kind of ridiculous. But then the best part to me was that it wasn't like everyone was just silent for a moment thinking, holy shit someone just got murdered next to us. That was intense. Several more people start like peeing themselves, screaming, running. And again, it just made me think of a cartoon where there's a bunch of people just like running around like a chicken with their head cut off, flailing, screaming, um, you know, running in circles, bumping into each other. Just the most physical comedy vaudevillian <laughs> style cartoon where, you know, they just keep getting scorched left and right and a bunch of people die because they get scared seeing someone get scorched. And so then 
they decide that they also should do the same thing that that person just did. <laughs> so they also get scorched. And it just happens like over and over and over and over again, just on another level. And I could understand having one person do that as an indication that even the people who volunteered to be in the writer's squadron and not all of them did volunteer. So sure, there might be some people who are conscripts who are just terrified of the idea of being near a dragon. But like, sure, have one person who freaks out, can't handle it, runs and gets scorched. Like, ooh, intense. Now we realize how dangerous the dragons are. But instead it just happens one after the other and they just keep doing it and it felt so ridiculous and over the top and silly but that I just couldn't take it seriously it was very funny speaking of moments that felt very cartoony and silly and funny the whole gauntlet challenge where they have to climb this mountain face and there's all these different challenges like spinning logs that they have to hop over and I don't really remember any of the other challenges there's lots of spinning logs basically it's built as a way for them to practice all the skills I guess that they're going to need to mount a dragon they have to be able to run up a ramp that's basically vertical so that they can, you know, run up a dragon's leg to mount them. You know, there's all kinds of things they have to be able to do. And this is sort of set up as a way for them to test that, I guess. But when I was reading the scenes of them being on it, I just kept imagining that TV show that's like, a game show challenge where people are on ridiculously gigantic oversized obstacle courses and they're just like jumping from a spinning thing to a spinning thing and then they bounce off it like they're a bouncy ball and like rebound into a pool of water or something and it's just like people being flailed off of giant bouncy castle obstacle courses one after the other with a laugh track underneath it. <laughs> That's what I was imagining. Very not menacing. And yet, just like with the <laughs> presentation, people are actually just dying left and right. Like anytime somebody makes a mistake, they just fall to their death. And once again, that just reinforces my whole issue with the fact that they're killing off cadets left and right, even though they are in dire need of people to fight this war. And I feel like it's just supposed to make us feel like this place is super tough and ruthless and also prepares for the fact that they're in fact the bad guys. Isn't it obvious they're bad guys? They're just killing everyone left and right. Children, they don't care. But it just feels so illogical and silly and it bothers me. <laughs> also, I don't understand Violet's mom. It's made clear at the beginning of the book that there was no chance that Violet was going to be able to become a scribe like she wanted, that her mother was going to force her to go to the writer's quadrant, even if it killed her. And if this was sort of a foregone conclusion, why would her mother not have her train for her entire life? Why would she only have her start training six months before? Apparently, there were also physical challenges that they had to pass, like tests they had to pass to even be allowed to do the parapet. And she was able to pass that, but then it felt after that like she had zero physical coordination and hadn't done any training. But then she also talked about training extensively for six months. And it's just all over the place. Like unless her mom specifically wanted her to die for some reason, which again, there's nothing to make us believe that. Why would she not prepare her child for it if she was going to force her to do it anyway? It's confusing. It's giving inconsistency. Liam is a sweet little baby and must be protected at all costs. And I will never forgive Rebecca for murdering him. He didn't deserve it. So many other people could have been murdered. I will say the only thing that actually shocked me in this book, the only twist that I didn't see coming was the fact that Violet's older brother is not actually dead. Did not see that coming. I don't know how I feel about it. We didn't really get a moment to process it. While I was shocked by that, you know, I was surprised and then it was the end of the book. <laughs> So I'm not sure how I feel about that. Like I feel kind of baited into reading the second book, which I guess is fair and authors can do that. But I just personally, maybe because I don't read as many series, I would prefer books to feel like they're totally self-contained. You might want to keep reading to get the next chapter of the story, but that the story that exists, you know, there's a beginning, middle and end. There's a satisfying conclusion to the story in each book in a series. That's at least what I am looking for when I read a series, especially if you have to wait a long time for the next one to come out. Although I feel like the next one might already be out, though I can't decide if I have the mental and emotional fortitude to put myself through another book in the series. But I felt like so much of this book was just setting up this final reveal. And then the next book that I imagine is going to go into, you know, the real history of what happened and Violet joining the rebellion. I feel like that's going to be the actual main storyline that the author was ramping up to. But the fact that I had to read a 500 page book to not even get that much background or world building or character development just for the actual story to start in book two, like that's not gonna work for me. <laughs> we could have cut so much out of this book, like easily half of this book didn't need to exist. So little happened for a 500 page book. 
So many scenes happened multiple times, almost verbatim. How many times did we have to read about Violet getting pinned somewhere by Zayden's hips against hers? Maybe have it happen twice so that it's like a callback, but for it to happen over and over and over and over again, like it's starting to lose its potency here. <laughs> There's also one point where Zayden's riding leathers are apparently malleable and loose enough that she can literally curl her entire hand around his, you know what, through his pants. Like they're tight riding pants made out of leather. Like what in the spandex is going on here? <laughs> the physics ain't physics scene. Okay, so I'm done sharing spoilery thoughts. This is going to be my very final wrap up of this whole reading experience. A couple final thoughts that occurred to me that I wanna add. I feel like this book is what would happen if Divergent and A Throne of Glass had a baby. <laughs> It has all of the tropes you might expect from YA speculative fiction. It's entertaining at times. There were moments that I chuckled. There were moments that I was engaged in a in a moment of a battle, you know, hoping that my favorite characters, aka the dragons, survived. There were moments that I was rooting for Rhiannon and Riddick getting lots of tale of multiple genders because they're my bisexual queen and king. But for me, all of the things that were left unsaid, all the things just left unraveled, <laughs> there were just so many missed opportunities, so many twists or reveals that were only partially set up or set up in such a clunky way that they were telegraphed way too early, super obvious, and therefore not satisfying. Poor writing, often just melodramatic, repetitive, awkward language that didn't really fit together. So many cringy, objectifying moments. So many cringy moments. There were just so many of those things that kept popping up through the whole thing and I couldn't help but feel, you know, grief for what could have been and yet did not come to be with this book. It had a lot of potential to be awesome and there were little flashes of awesome. Again, dragons. The, dr the dragons were awesome. But like pretty much everything else had potential, was not delivered. It just felt a little bit paint by numbers of a YA fantasy. Also just once I would like a tall, strong woman to fall in love with a smaller man and for that to be totally fine. Like I promise the universe will not explode. <laughs> we will continue to survive. The sun will rise again every day, even if in a heterosexual pairing, the woman is taller and bigger than the man. I promise you. I would love for someone to be brave enough to break out of convention there because we're tired. For some people, the fact that it was entertaining is enough and they had a good time and they're happy and that's totally fine. Once again, different people want different things when they're reading. And if you enjoyed this book, I am so happy for you. Truly, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm actually very happy for people who enjoyed it. For me though, it just, didn't really deliver what I was hoping for. So as for rating for this book, I might change this, okay? This isn't set in stone. I only finished this book earlier today, but I think I'm sitting around two stars, mostly because of the dragons and Rhiannon and Riddick. I liked them a lot. So I feel like they get another star <laughs> from me, but pretty much everything else was a one star level book. For me personally, once again. As for whether I would recommend it, honestly, I totally would to the audience of people who would enjoy this. And I feel like if you've watched this entire video at this point, you're gonna know if this is your kind of book or not. And if it is your kind of book, if it sounds up your alley, you'll probably love it because lots of people do. For people who are more like me with their preferences, I wouldn't recommend it unless you are into reading something just to cringe at it and eye roll. If that's what you want to do with your time and you feel like reading 500 pages for that purpose, go ahead. I don't think it's a horrible book in every way or anything like that. There were things that I liked. There were just many things that didn't work for me. And that's fine because we're all different. We all have different opinions and that's what makes the world interesting. So if you have read Fourth Wing and you haven't already shared what you thought about the book in the comments, please do it. I would love to know what all of you thought, any of you who have read Fourth Wing. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me on all of the things touched on in this video? I wanna know, share your thoughts down below. If you haven't read Fourth Wing, I would love to know if this video made you wanna read it or not. You know, no shame either way. <laughs> I support you all in your life choices. You are presumably an adult and you have autonomy, so. 
keep on keeping on. I will put a book card up on the screen with any of the trigger content warnings I noticed while reading, representation I noticed, etc. Yeah, I feel like I've said everything that I can say about this book at this point. I do kind of want to finish this video by just reading some of the quotes that stood out to me most because some of them were really funny in how cringy they were. And I just want to share, especially for anyone who's not going to be reading this book, just so you can get a little taste. I can't just hold it all in my brain because um, I feel like that's not healthy. <laughs> so here we go. By killing people, I cry. If Segale is right and signets reflect who we are at our core, then I'm exactly as Zayden nicknamed me, violence. Here's uh, the only chapter that's from Zayden's perspective. I nearly swallow my tongue at the sight of her unbound, damp hair curling just under her breasts. I can't even articulate what it is about the strands that pushes me straight into need to her now territory, and I'm too busy fighting to keep my hands at my sides to question the why of it. She exists, and I get turned on. I've come to accept that particular truth over the last year. And Zayden. No matter how strong he is, Zayden won't be able to hold them forever. His arms already shake with the effort of controlling so much power. He'll be the first to die if I'm not exactly what he called me under that tree all those months ago. Violence. Okay, Violet, chill. My hand curls around the dagger's hilt and I feel it hum with power. Venin are real. Venin are real. Mira, I scream, clawing at Zayden's arms, but he's already half carrying me down the stairs with an arm clamped around my waist as if I weigh less than the sword on his back. Once again, she's so tiny, she's so small. She's like a little ant. The inches between us feel like kindling, ready to burn at the first suggestion of heat, and I'm a living, breathing flame. This is everything I should run from, and yet denying the primal attraction I feel is completely, utterly impossible. Every edge of Zayden's body is honed like a weapon, all sharp lines and barely leashed power. His rebellion relic twists around his upper body and stands out against the deep bronze of his skin, accentuating every punch he throws, and his stomach. I mean, how many muscles are there in the abdominals? <laughs> I thought you were well read, Violet. Don't you know how many muscles are in the abdominals? Come on, do better. Just like it always does, my stupid, hormone-driven heart stutters at the first sight of Zayden. Even the most effective poisons come in pretty packages, and Zayden's exactly that, as beautiful as he is lethal. He doesn't even have to try to look sexy. He just is. Anyways, you get it. I'm not going to read every quote I tagged as eye roll because we would be here all night. <laughs> but you get the idea. So that's it. That's all I have to say, I think. I feel like if I keep recording, I'll think of more things to say, and I feel like this video is already gonna be very long, so I'm just gonna force myself to stop. <laughs> I hope this was entertaining. Whether you enjoyed this book or not, we're all book lovers, and that's awesome. And I hope the next book you read is one you love, whether that's Fourth Wing or something else, because we all deserve to read books that we love. This was not a love for me, but it was, you know, an entertaining um, and slightly ridiculous experience, and I wouldn't trade it for the world because I got to share it with all of you. That was ridiculously cheesy. I apologize, but I just read a super cheesy, <laughs> corny, cliched book. So what do you want from me? I'm gonna go. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a like, subscribe if you haven't already for more reading vlogs like this one. If you have requests or suggestions for books, I should include in a reading vlog, leave them down below. Join my Patreon if you wanna be part of my book club. My patrons are the best. I appreciate them so, so much. And with that, I'm gonna get going. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you really soon in my next one. Bye friends.